Uh, it's wonderful to be with you all uh, on this Monday afternoon. Uh, my name, for those of you that don't know me, is John Lustria. I'm the Education Coordinator at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine and thrilled to be joined today by Professor uh, Peter Carmichael, who teaches up at Gettysburg College. Welcome, Pete. John, thank you so much for having me on the show, and it is always good to see you and to see that you and I both have COVID hair. Uh, yours looks a little bit more fashionable than, uh, than mine. Have you ever heard of Henry Clay Pate? Henry Clay Pate was a cab officer in the Army in Northern Virginia. Uh, before the war, he got into a little bit of a spat with John Brown and Jason Phillips and his very, very good book on the coming of the war, The Looming Civil War. He writes about Henry Clay Pate. Henry Pate, Clay Pate did make up uh, with Jeb Stewart. I need to get back to the original part of my story and was killed um, at Yellow Tavern. And as you know, that's where Stuart was mortally wounded. So uh, yes, yeah, so you need to look up Henry Clay Pate and you'll see that you've got uh, locks just like his. I'll make a note. Yeah, uh, I got my hair cut last on March 6th, which was right before things started shutting down. And uh, I kept saying, well, you know, I'll, I'll let it grow until, you know, you know, we get back to work and like, well, well, let it grow until Halloween so I can do something funky with it for a costume. And now I'm like, oh, I wonder if I can go a year between haircuts. So it's a keeper. Yeah. yeah. Who, who knows? We'll, we'll see how long it grows or maybe one day I'll abruptly get tired of it. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> my, my motivations are varied and it's in part out of laziness, I have to admit. Uh, the other part is uh, I'm an only child and thus I derive all kinds of joy in tormenting my mother. Uh, which of course is absolutely cruel of me, but she detests my hair. And, uh, and so uh, if she's watching, I'm sure she's squirming in her seat right now. <laughs> oh man. Well, speaking of people watching, we've, uh, we've got uh, just about 60 people with us already. We got uh, uh, Marty in Virginia, Robert in Florida, another Robert in Florida, um, uh, Barbara, who uh, I'm, uh, is a regular watcher with us. Um, another John in Florida. We got a lot of people in Florida. So thank you so much for tuning in already. Uh, it's always fun to see and hear where people are, are watching from. Um, if you like this video and all of the videos we've been doing, uh, go ahead and give this video a like. It helps us out tremendously. Uh, consider sharing the video and tell your friends about it so more people get a chance to, uh, to see it. Uh, and if you like what we, uh, what we do here and uh, don't already like the National Museum of Civil War Medicine on Facebook, that's the best way to stay up to date with all of these live streams that we do. Um, we do these twice a week. And if you tune in late or you have to leave early, uh, these videos continue to exist on our Facebook page. So you can always go back and rewatch some of our old ones or catch up on the parts of this one that maybe you have to miss uh, for one reason or the other. Uh, and then John, finally, John, the- John, I was asking, what if you love what you do? Can you hit the little heart? Does it just have to be the like? Can it be the <laughs> It doesn't just button? have to be the like. You Maybe can you hit the uh, the heart button. Yeah. Um, and, and there's all manner of other uh, other different uh, reactions you can have. You can you can hit the laugh button if you find something funny. Um, there's all kinds of things you can do. Good, all right, good um, to know. Yes, express yourself uh, as freely as you want. Um, and then finally, the, the best way that you can support us in these videos is to become a member of the Museum of Civil War Medicine. Um, for as low as $25 a year, um, that's just a couple bucks a month. Uh, that's a lot less than uh, you pay for Netflix. Um, that really helps us uh, support uh, this work. There's a link in the comments um, to be able to do that. And John, uh, I would say that some of the videos that, well, you're doing now and elsewhere, they are probably produced uh, at a quality that e exceeds some of the Netflix stuff that I've seen. Some of that Netflix stuff, I'm like, this is, you know, a bunch of guys who put something together over a long weekend. So, I, yeah, I think you get your money's worth if you join the, uh, the National Medical Museum in Frederick. Oh, thank you, Pete. I appreciate that. Um, we got, uh, we're getting towards 70 people being on with us. We got Andrea from Mississippi, Deborah uh, from North, Car North Carolina, originally from Illinois. We got Margaret, uh, Gettysburg volunteer from Staten Island. Um, Lois, um, hi to Peter from Jim and Lois Ullman in Williamsburg. Oh my God, yes, I love them. I haven't seen them forever. They're wonderful. I'll have to make a uh, note of that. 
Uh, and we got uh, Jim Broomall on. Uh, thank, thank you, Jim, for saying that the Civil War Medicine Museum is doing fantastic work. So we've got some really lovely people in the comments. So thank you all for being with us here today. If you and I'm thrilled that I'm, I'm thrilled that Broomall is with us, as we all know he's an academic, and this is usually his nap time. He gets his lunch in, gets his little nap, and then he goes off to class. So I appreciate it, Jim. Uh, sacrificing his nap time for us. Yeah, we, we absolutely appreciate that. Uh, again, if you're just joining now, uh, John Lustria, uh, Education Coordinator at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, joined today by Pete Carmichael, Professor at Gettysburg College, and we're going to be talking about primary sources, um, and we're going to go through a few of them uh, in just a little bit here in the program, but I want to get us started um, with uh, asking you, Pete, about kind of how do you approach primary sources? Obviously, they're a key building block of how we know what we know about the past. Um, how do you approach them? Are, are there specific things you, you look for or what's your process like? Well, well, at the risk of immediately boring your audience and watching your numbers go from 60 to 10, I'll be a little autobiographical to say that my exposure to primary sources came very young. It came in high school uh, when you know, I did the normal things that teenagers did. I played basketball and did sports, but I also just had this obsession with the Civil War. And I was fortunate to have parents who always were encouraging. And on the weekends, they would drop me off at the Indiana Historical Society. So, and all the cool kids were at the mall. I was at the archives. And one of the first collections, a collection that uh, I have worked with extensively since I was 16, I'm in my 50s now is a collection of David Bean, the letters of David Bean. He's a 14th Indiana soldier. And that, of course, that moment in high school in encountering this source, it was uh, uh, that, that connection that one feels. When you just go to a historic site, right? Th this letter took it to a very different place for me as a young person, and I was immediately hooked. And to then answer your question is that that letter, as other letters, uh, they felt like a transparent window into the past. You know, all I had to do was read and then I would immediately get the truth of that experience. And so as I progressed in my career into college and even into grad school, I still believe that the goal of a historian is one, to accumulate as many primary sources as possible, to do deep digging, and I still do believe in that. But it's from that deep digging that I concluded early in my career that one can find uh, patterns of thought and that those patterns of thought would then reveal to us uh, what's significant and what's important, uh, what we need to register as the truth of the past. That approach of letting the sources just speak for themselves, uh, my approach that you know, shaped how I thought about history when I was looking at David Beam's letters, that approach I would say uh, I came to question about a decade ago uh, and question it in a sense that I'm not denying, again, the importance of collecting manuscript material. I'm not trying to suggest that when you read a letter or a diary that you cannot draw from that the truth of that individual's experience. What I have though reached a conclusion about is that one's relationship with a source, whether it be a letter, a diary, it could be material culture, it could be visual culture, that that relationship should actually be one that's antagonistic, that one that is um, more judgmental, uh, one that does not simply sit back and say, let the words of that individual wash over me. And from that, I will get a feel for what happened at that particular moment in time. And so I know we have a document and maybe you have a follow-up question, but I can, I think, and I know I can with a document, uh, reveal how I interrogate a source. And again, I want to be abundantly clear that the hunt for primary sources is unfortunately undervalued in our field right now amongst professional academic, academics. Uh, unfortunately, too much of our work is not done in the archives. It is in the archives where there are treasure troves that have not been properly mined. And so the primary source material that is out there that is truly oceanic, 
Uh, there is so much of it that is left to, for us to explore. There are so many important articles and books that will come out of that material. And so the primary source, it's our lifeblood. I hope though that all of us will always have an uncomfortable relationship with those sources. And, and John, if you have a follow-up, we can do that, or we can go to the first document if you like. Um, that, that's such an interesting word you use, and uh, almost an antagonistic relationship between um, the historian and, and the documents. Um, and just to kind of underscore the point you were just making about how, you know, there's so much rich material out there that has yet to be mined. I mean, I'll, I'll speak for myself. Even here at the museum, there's a number of um, small letter collections that, you know, I haven't uh, gone through that I would love to and, you know, I'm sure have all kinds of interesting things to say. And that's just here at this one institution. So um, you're absolutely right. There's there's tons of, of stuff out there. Uh, and I'll add, if you have any question at any point during the program for uh, Peter, myself, please drop it in the comments and we'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll get to it or we'll try and get to it as we go. And can I say also, John, if you don't mind, even mm -hmm. if you don't have a question and you have an opinion that's different from what you know I'm suggesting here, please, I think debate is healthy and desired. So feel free to not just ask us something. If you've got your own opinion, put it out there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, well, I, I sort of do have a follow-up question, but it might be best asked um, by going to one of the, the sources that we have queued up to go through here. Uh, and that is, uh, I, I'd like you to say more about this antagonistic, this reading between the lines, this uh, not taking things at face value idea that you're putting out here. Um, do you want to say anything about that before we turn to a document or should we just get right into it? Yeah, well, let me say something very briefly and then we'll go to the document. The best way to understand what I mean by a more antagonistic relationship with primary sources is to think about documents, not just how they reflect a historical moment, but how they represent a moment. And that question of representation is absolutely crucial if one is to properly understand what the intended meaning or purpose of that author was. And we often, I think, overlook that so that each letter, again, is something that should be seen as a construction or as a creation. That doesn't mean that there's something false about it. That construction or that depiction is based upon that individual's perception of reality. They take in that reality, they take it in through a variety of cultural lenses. It could be gender, race, class, or a wide range of things, right? And as they take in and process that moment, that event, they then do what? Then they then take that experience and they put it on paper. And in so doing, they're one, they are being a historian, which we often overlook. Soldiers are our first historians of the mm -hmm. Civil War. Mm -hmm. And so what they put on paper, it is a narrative. It's a historical narrative and it has an intent and it has a purpose based upon who's receiving it. And so there is a profound difference between a public document and a private document. And even private documents have deeply political messages to them. And I'm going to keep saying it. I'm going to keep repeating it. I am not suggesting that when a writer puts his or her thoughts on paper, that that's an artificial act. I am not suggesting that that individual is falsifying, falsifying their experience or creating some form of propaganda. I'm not suggesting any of that. I'm reminding all of us that the act of putting one's experiences to paper right, is a creation of a narrative. That narrative, choices are being made. They're being made by that historical actor. Choices are being made as to what is kept in that narrative, what's left out of that narrative, what's emphasized, what's not emphasized. Those are choices. Mm -hmm. When we see that, right, we see the document now as taking on a richer life, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't just become a document that chronicles the past. It's not just a document that is, oh, here's what happened. It becomes something very different, more layered. And I think we are able then to grasp its fuller, its full significance. And I think the document that, that you have queued up uh, will help illustrate that. Yeah, and, and to say one other point about, you know, the choices that these authors are making, you know, they're, they're probably more often than not, not even sinister choices. I, I think sometimes when, 
you know, people hear the idea that, you know, the author's making choices about what to put in and what to leave out. They're thinking censorship. They're thinking, the, you know, sinister. They're trying to spin the events of the past, you know, which maybe. Um, but I think sometimes it's just either they're not thinking about something or, you know, they don't think it's important enough to include. There's any number of reasons that are very not sinister for why something might be left John, out. Yeah, John, I'm so glad you said that. It's well said. You're spot on. And again, at the risk of, of sounding political, but I'm not. It's just the hard fact that we live in a world now in which we have a current president who has made a point that if anyone disagrees with him, that he often labeled that as fake news. And he did that to, from CNN to Fox to even the Wall Street Journal. That's just the hard truth. That's the fact. The result of that, though, is that I think we have people who unfortunately struggle with differences of interpretation. There's no differences of interpretation. There is a truth and there's not a truth. And that is, of course, a troubling consequence when we think about contemporary issues and how people, how a society comes to debate and negotiate those issues. That's one point. But I'm afraid it has what? That it has bled into how we see the past. And so that we will have Americans who will look to the history and say what? Give us the truth the truth, the singular truth, which of course us and the people who are watching today know that that just simply does not exist. That history is about interpretation, many interpretations, many different perceptions and many different experiences. So, good. Exactly so. So with that, um, we'll turn to our first document here. Um, so talk a little bit about the, the context of this and then we can get into uh, you know, how, how, you, how you approach something like this. Yeah, so uh, this was a resolution that was passed by members of uh, Forsberg's Brigade, part of Gabriel Wharton's division. This was one of many proclamations that came from, well, this is not from the Army of Northern Virginia, it's from the Army of the Valley, but many came from Lee's Army in Northern Virginia. In the spring of 1865, published in newspapers, mostly Richmond papers, but also you can find them elsewhere. And in these resolutions, the men, they affirm their devotion and dedication to the Confederate cause. And as we'll see here in just a moment, they pointed to many reasons as to why they should continue on the fight. And these proclamations, these declarations, in the eyes of some historians, is evidence that Confederate morale remained strong even in the final stages of the war that one can find in the ranks of the Confederate Army. The, the zealots, I'm giving Jason Phillips a lot of love here today. <laughs> I think Jason Phillips in his book, Die Hard Confederates, also Gary Gallagher in his book on Confederate war. And to a lesser degree, we'll give Jim Brumaw here a shout out who will wake Jim up here right now. And Jim's book on private confederacies as well, though Jim doesn't deal with questions of nationalism. Nonetheless, uh, Jim gets into that inner world of Southern soldiers and found with many of them, not all, but many of them, they also had a devotion uh, to the Confederate cause. It's this piece of evidence. Now, Jim never used this kind of source, and I suspect he probably reached some of the conclusions that I'm about to reach uh, regarding it, uh, but others have not. I, Keith Bohannon, a dear friend of mine, he's looked at resolutions like this from the Army of Tennessee, and then a fantastic book, it just happens to be right by my side here, Zach Fry, book called A Republic in the Ranks, looking at the Army of the Potomac, a uh, big part of this book is Zach's uh, examination of resolutions from the Army of the Potomac in the spring of 1863, pledging their allegiance to the Union cause and threatening anyone back on the home front with violence if they didn't what? <laughs> Be quiet, right? Be quiet and support the war. So this source is the kind of source that uh, I look at very differently than I would have when I started off my career. I uh, started off my career, I would have looked at this source and I would have drawn a few points from it. And so here we go. Let's start with, let's go at, let's make it easy here. Let's go down to the third resolve. Resolve that with the great and glorious Lee, the Christian gentleman and chivalrous soldier for our leader, we are content to cast the interest of our struggling country, believing that his cool judgment and soldierly ability and Christian conduct will eventually lead us forth to victory, honor, and liberty. So, you know, I'm gonna throw this back to you, John. John, tell me, when you read that, what do you think? How do, how do you handle that piece of information? Is that um, a piece of evidence 
that helps us understand Confederate motivations at that time of the war or not? Well, the first thing that I would think of is that, you know, this is a, we talked earlier about the difference between public and private documents. I mean, this is certainly meant to be a public sort of document, which would color how I see it. Um, and that there's, you know, pretty public vocal support for Lee. But since this is sort of a collective resolution, uh, it's, I would imagine, really hard to get at, you know, let's let's say a thousand people put this together you know or however many um it's hard to kind of get at you know if there was any discussion on that point or you know if everyone you know agrees in as resounding of terms uh, uh as they they list there um and, and all that so I, I to answer your question directly i think it's kind of hard to get a get a sense of what this you know uh, of what this might tell us about Confederate morale and motivation, et cetera. I mean, it doesn't tell us nothing, but we need to think specifically about what it can tell us. There's a public affirmation of it, and that's important. But John, I like the first point that you made because we're really not certain who is behind this. We're not really certain what were the debates, the conversations that led to this declaration, this resolution. We see that it's signed by the committee, and there, there are no names to that. And yet, John, I think that you and I and the people who are watching right now are I would suspect, I hope, in wide agreement that Gary Gallagher is spot on in his work. He found that there was not just widespread um, faith and confidence in Ari Leaf, but as the war progressed, that the rank and file looked to him as the savior. In fact, one Confederate artillerist in the spring of 1865 said that he'd like to see Lee as either king or dictator, that he was one of the few great men, to quote this man, one of the few great men who ever lived. Now, if I'm Jeff Davis, I'm not so sure I'm happy about this. Well, <laughs> right. that, that, that was That's, one of the things that yeah, I that yeah. I noted that it says, you know, uh, this, Lee, this our leader, a, and, I'm, and I wrote in the margins, like, what about Jeff Davis? Yeah, it's a little off-putting, I'd say, if I were old Jeff Davis, but, uh, but he's a politician. He's He's, uh, he's been knocked around. I'm sure that he can handle something like this. There's a bigger question here, though, John, that I'd ask of this source, or I should say, if I could, ask the committee. <laughs> Why did they feel compelled to even put this resolution in the papers? The very fact that they decided to do this reveals to us that there are some serious and significant problems within that particular army. And we know from our understanding of what was happening in Virginia in the spring of 1865. That desertion was skyrocketing, morale was plummeting. And that does not mean that there was not a hard core of devoted soldiers. Now, in this case, we're talking about the Valley Army, but we know in the Army of Northern Virginia, certainly there were plenty of men still in the ranks and they were there for a variety of reasons. But this is again, and I don't want to get too academic on us, this is called a public transcript. This is for public consumption. This is to affirm not just to the soldiers and not just to politicians, but to the people back home that the boys in the ranks, that they are still determined to keep fighting this thing on. There's no doubt about it. This has a very public and political intent. But there is a hidden transcript. Hidden transcript is from the anthropologist James Scott. I won't bore you all with any more academic nonsense, but his observations are telling. And the hidden transcript is simply this. This committee from Forsberg's brigade and Wharton's division felt compelled to do this because there were obvious problems. And of course, we could go to other sources, such as the muster rolls of the regiments in Forsberg's brigade to see that in fact, uh, these were Southwest Virginia units and they always struggled with the issue of desertion, but particularly so in the spring of 1865. So this document does so many different things from us and God, that was just from that one little bit about Lee the Christian gentleman. Does this affirm Gary Gallagher's argument? Yeah, but it also raises questions about Gallagher's argument. Does it tell us something about the problems that were besieging the Confederacy and Confederate armies at this time? Not directly, but it certainly raises some question marks in my mind. All right. How are we doing here on time? You want to take another part of this, John? Uh, yeah, we're doing great so far. Yeah, let's do it. Um, yeah, ta tackle another part. Sure. All right. All right. So let's go to the second one, resolved. All right. Desiring a peace and its attendant bl blessings, and we are convinced that we are dealing with a crafty, cruel, and merciless foe whom we distrust so much 
that were he to come with the Bible in one hand, we would look for the tacker in the other. And we know that while he proffers us peace, he plans our destruction. Now, again, the intent, of the question that I ask about this is not how many soldiers believe this? Because as John, as you sort of, I think alluded to, who knows? There's no way we could ever make that determination. I grow frustrated with people who say, well, was that the common belief? Well, I believe it was. Wait, there's just no way of determining that. But what this line does for us, and again, if there was a gong show right now, John, you'd hit the gong on me because I'm going to go academic on you all one more time. <laughs> but it's the only word to use here, and that word is discourse. It's misused all the time. People use discourse as discussing. That's not what it means. If you don't like the word discourse, fine. Think of it this way, though. Think of the dominant idea of those who have power. The dominant idea of those who have power. Now, that line about the risk of uh, brokering some kind of peace deal with the Yankees, you try it. That line warns everybody that not just defeat, but destruction, annihilation, ruination of one's way of life. How much people believe this? It's difficult to say. But I know that the message that came from the Confederate ruling class, whether it be Richmond, whether it be the military, was one in which the stakes of the game, they spelled out very clearly, and they spelled it out in the most dire terms, that if, in fact, peace was sought, that it would result in the destruction of a way of life to a people who have demonstrated that they are not what? That they are not godly people. What this document and this particular resolution does for us is it helps us understand the framework in which people define acceptable speech. Let me give you a better example, and I'm not going to use this. And John, you're going to have to do the answer here. Ready? Here we okay. go. It is early August, 1863. Much of these army is back in the Shenandoah Valley. I think some has trickled over the Blue Ridge and over toward Culpeper. The survivors are taking stock of what has happened. And one man, non-slaveholder, who's lost two of his best friends at Gettysburg, his family suffering back in North Carolina. He's angry, angry at the war, angry at the army and he wants to express himself. Now he's gonna express himself in camp around the campfire. Tell me what this man can say. He's really angry, here we go. Number one, Robert E. Lee is a cruel son of a bitch and got us all shot to hell up in Pennsylvania. There's your first answer. Number two, the Yankees whipped the hell out of us. They've got all the men and all the food that one can possibly imagine. We saw it right up there in Virginia. We are screwed. This war is done. There's answer two. Answer number three. Ready? We fought hard. Our men were shot down. I'm not sure what's going to happen next, but we can only put our trust in God because the dessert is to risk everything. Of those three answers, man's really mad. Which one can he say? Uh, probably the, uh, the final one. Uh, the, the first two are just too inflammatory. That's right. Now, again, this, I hope this exercise serves a purpose. And the purpose, again, is to understand what was acceptable expressions of dissent. And so for many, they want to find, among Confederates who were disillusioned with the war, they want to find those Confederate soldiers denouncing the Confederate cause by saying that this war was a rich man's war, that this war was just for the slaveholders, that R. E. Lee and Jefferson Davis, they're just getting poor people all shot up. To expect Confederates to 
poor Confederates, to employ that kind of language is just simply beyond what was possible at the time. And so far too often when we look at a document, now I'll bring it back to this one in front of us, when we look at a document such as this, and when we try to suggest that this document reflects or captures the sentiment of Confederate soldiers, it explains to us why so many men continue to fight even during the final months of the war, I want to hold back here for just a moment and just remind us that this document is not a reflection of sentiment. This document is what? It's a shaper of sentiment. It is the boundaries of what's acceptable. This document is coercive. That's what this document is. And just because it's coercive does not mean that it wasn't heartfelt. Yeah, so to to kind of basically put what you said another way, um, the kind of knee-jerk reaction when reading this is to say, oh, well, you know, they shouldn't trust peace, you know, Confederates shouldn't trust peace from, uh, from the Yankees. We trust Robert E. Lee implicitly. And while it's certainly possible that some of them may have felt that way, um, we one of the things like we need to recognize the limitations uh, of what these sources can tell us. And we don't have any kind of firm evidence that that was a widespread belief purely based off of reading this source. And what we want to think about all this is in a more fluid way. Loyalty isn't one thing or the other. And so one can imagine that, let's just say, a non-slaveholder from Southwest Virginia could easily believe that the Confederate cause was a cause under God's protection. He could easily believe that the Yankees were a disgraceful, mean-spirited, godless people could believe all of that. He could have great love for R.E. Lee, and yet at the same time, he could think that this war was a war that was needlessly getting people killed. That part of this uh, political belief can nowhere be found here because again, this is a resolution that is a public political document. Too often historians take these kinds of documents and they use it as a blanket generalization over Confederate morale or Confederate motivation, and it misses so much. It, it just again comes back to the point that every document has many voices that come out of this. And for me, the very fact again that this document, that it was passed, and again, as you pointed out, John, who knows how this thing was passed? Because I'll just quickly add, after uh, Gettysburg, resolutions came out from the Army in Northern Virginia. A soldier, William Wagner, I think he he's, he's 54th North Carolina, I believe. Uh, Wagner wrote uh, to his wife and said that the proclamations that were being published in the newspapers were all lies, that the officers had passed them and that the men had nothing to say or had nothing to do with it. Uh, and again, I don't know if that's the case here, but I think your you know, original point is again, one that you have to give some consideration to. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and part of, I guess, what being antagonistic with the primary source means is to be very intentional about thinking um, what it cannot tell us, even though it appears that it does tell us something. In this case, that there was widespread you know, uh, belief and enthusiasm for the Confederate cause late, late in the war. And, and John, I'll end on this point. And this is, again, I, I think we've come at this at different angles. I don't care whether this document is truthful or not. I don't care about that. What I care about is why this committee felt that they had to represent or depict the war in this way. Was it truthful to them? Without a question. But why they felt they had to do this, that's what matters most to me. And it's that angle that reveals they got some problems and some serious problems. If your authority and your power is solid and firm, you don't need to do this. You don't need to do this. A mm -hmm. uh, couple questions from sure. the comments that I think we can sort of take together and sure. might be useful as we go to uh, another document. Um, they get at this um, from a slightly different angle because the document we're just looking at isn't necessarily in reference to a specific event. Um, uh, Robert asks, how do you factor in the time between the event and the time of the document in your evaluation? And then Helen adds with a separate but related question. She, she says, what is the role of memory in the soldier writing his or her document? So the, the first question is one that I used to believe that 
that any document that is created um, after the event, and if it's and the farther and farther away it is from that event, the less reliable it is, and that's just a false assumption. Uh, in fact, is if you any of us can just think about an experience that we've had and how over time certain aspects of that experience for whatever reason come back to us and uh, and i and i give you an example here not from experience but police officers say that if they interview a suspect and if that suspect gives the same exact story time after time after time after time they go very suspicious of that suspect right that that's just not how most people recollect and remember events. Um, the delineation between memory and the event itself, I, I don't make that delineation um, with the kind of rigidity that I think others do. And as soon as a person puts pen to paper, that's obviously memory at work. I think that the best way of, again, going about this is to understand the fluidity in which people think about uh, what they've experienced in terms of historical events and how their understanding of those events tend to change over time. I mean, that certainly is, I think, answering this question that is memory at work, but I don't have a, a sharp divide. Like here is history and here is memory. Uh, because as I said to you before, you know, as soon as a soldier put pen to paper, that, that's memory at work. That's memory at work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, in the documents written decades after the war, you know, you look at them a little bit differently. So it's, you know, certainly something that you take into, into consideration, but uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, you can't just totally ignore them just because they happened a long, long time afterwards. And as you see the evidence, I'm trying to say, when I said the fluidity, how about this, the evolution of thinking over time and the context that, that shapes and gives color and purpose to how history is remembered over time. And that doesn't make, for example, the uh, soldier reunions, let's say, I don't know, in, in 1913, you know, I looked at that not as well, is that a truthful recreation or a truthful recovery of what happened in 1863. I don't, I'm not interested in any of that. You know, what I'm interested in is in that moment in 1913, why is it that they decide to create narratives about Gettysburg that say blank? That's what I wanna understand. I wanna understand that moment rather than simply saying, oh, for example, you know, uh, I'm always want to see some documents here in a moment. I've always been somewhat surprised by historians who suggest that Civil War soldiers tried to keep the the painful, brutal, savage elements of war from their readers. There are plenty of accounts, and John found one for us today that we'll see in just a moment, that pulled back the curtains on the war. I would say the same thing about the post-war period. I think Jim Bruma. Again, uh, his, his book, Private Confederacies, is just a fantastic book. I think I have it right here. I, I've, I've been so influenced by it in, in so many ways. And one of the things that Jim does so well in this is he looks at material culture, how things and artifacts, how the meaning that people, soldiers associated with that, again, changed over time. And Jim's new project in looking at visual culture is opening up for us how soldiers explored that the painful um, dark side of war that too often we say oh they just turned their backs on all that so you know when we look at issues of memory i always try to refrain from making a judgment that one expression is more truthful than the other or rather i want to understand as i think jim is going to be able to explain to us why at certain moments particular veterans found the, the will uh, to be able to face some really hard, painful stuff and to put it on canvas. I want to understand that moment rather than saying, you know what, damn it, they lied to us during the war and they got truthful here, right? That's why I'm not interested in that. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Uh, and a shameless plug, uh, what Pete is saying uh, to you about Jim's book, Private Confederacies, is interesting to you. We uh, interviewed Jim about said book uh, many months ago on our Facebook page, so you can go back and watch that. We also sell Private Confederacies as well as Pete's book, uh, The War for the Common Soldier. Um, 
in our bookshop and if you you can either pick that up by coming into the museum or you can write to us at store at civilwarmed.org uh, to see about picking up a copy. Do you get a discount at the bookstore if you're a member? You sure do. How about that? I love so, that. If I could put a love down right now, I would do it. <laughs> Yet another great reason to sign up and become a member. Absolutely. Um, do you want to start? Let's turn to another of our yeah, documents. Perfect. Whatever you want to do. Man. You want to do the surgeon? Um, yeah, let's, let's do uh, Surgeon William Child here. Since you shared this, John, why don't you get us started here? Tell us the parts that you found to be compelling. Um, so this is written by uh, William Child, surgeon of the 5th New Hampshire. Um, it's from a great collection of letters um, uh, about him, very creatively titled Letters from a Civil War Surgeon. Um, and in this one, he, he writes this after Fredericksburg, um, after um, coming from the Antietam battlefield not terribly long ago. Um, one of the things that we talk about a lot here at the museum is that Civil War battles are not just one or two or three day incidents. The, you know, the people have to stay on the battlefield caring for the wounded months, months after the battle. So even though Fredericksburg happens in December, he's just come from uh, Antietam, uh, which is what his reference there to Smoketown is, uh, uh, means and he's you know talking about sort of his experience during and immediately after the battle um, but the line that that um, line or paragraph that certainly jumped out to me comes towards the uh, the bottom of this uh, this first page here um, where he transitions so seamlessly um, from talking about you know how much he he misses his family and loves his family um, to talking about you know just how awful his experience in the aftermath of battles is. Um, he writes, uh, I love to have you tell me all the little sayings of my children, tell them I think of them every night, even when shot and shell, cannons roar, musket rattle, and the groaning wounded men are all about me. Three days at Antietam and one night at Fredericksburg have given me enough of battle. Some men might say I was a coward to talk so, but let them try it. Um, so, and particularly the way that he kind of invokes cowardice. So this whole idea of, you know, what are soldiers uh, and surgeons permitted to say? Um, you know, I certainly, and I know Pete, you've done a, a fair bit of work in, in cowardice in your, your book. Um, so I'm sure you have some opinions on this, but you know, this wasn't something that people talked about in a very regular way. It's not to say they didn't talk about it, um, but he's just coming out and saying like, this is terrible. You know, some people might uh, say otherwise, but uh, yeah. So what, what are your thoughts on, on either that section or this whole letter? Yeah, no, well, just the section that, you, uh, that you've just read. The first thing is what I uh, suggested before is that the soldiers during the war actually were very open, uh, very graphic in their descriptions of the horrors of battle. They often felt very frustrated because they thought language failed them, that words were all they had, but it just was not enough. And, and here is um, where others, I think, historians have come in to help us understand what violence did to the bodies and minds of Civil War soldiers through material culture. And Michael DiGreccio, I believe that's how you pronounce his last name, Michael DiGreccio in a piece um, is fantastic on material culture and how these things of war, how they became ways in which um, the people back home could literally touch what violence did, and, and let me give you, I think, a better example of that, is after, uh, after Appomattox, it's May of 1865, Sherman's men had passed through Richmond. Uh, they came to Spotsylvania Courthouse. Uh, there's just one element of, of um, Sherman's command. They had actually fought at Chancellorsville, and they, they ventured over to their old battlefield. But for many of Sherman's men, they were preoccupied with finding the things of war. And many of uh, the people here who are watching know that the 22 inch oak tree at the Bloody Angle, which was felled by bullets alone, uh, that that was in Spotsylvania Courthouse. And it was set up as, um, as almost like a, a little show that you had, I believe you even had to pay to go see it. 
and it might seem odd to us as to why these men would want to see that 22 inch oak tree or why they would go off into the woods and they would find you know, pieces of uh, limbs that, are, that were riddled with bullet holes. You know, why would they do that? Because it's that thing that captures or contains uh, how lethal the violence was during the war. Right? And, and they wanted the soldiers, they wanted the people to be able to understand it. But why this letter is so revealing and so important is that he speaks very graphically. God, he says that a man's brain splattered over another soldier. I mean, good God almighty. I says at the beginning there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, somewhere yeah. Uh, yeah. in the middle here. And, and so he, he, he gives that. And then he also is very descriptive about the sounds of battle and how those sounds clearly he could not get out of his head. He wants the people back home to feel the war. But if you get back to the bottom of that again, John, what I again find to be so fascinating is his, it's, it's an ugliness and nastiness when he writes, I wish every person in Bath who has talked so savagely about this war could pass through one battle. And so here we see. Well, and, and he says, see the suffering to your point about language suffering. failing. Yeah, and see the suffering. You're exactly right. See the suffering. And so I think that Gerald Linderman's book, In Battle Courage, I don't know if your bookstore sells it. It's a book that is, I think, it stood the test of time. It's a book that it certainly has its problems and issues. All books do, except mine and Jim's. But outside <laughs> our two books, um, you know, what Linderman, I think, was persuasive and right about is the gap that emerged between soldiers and, and civilians. And, and certainly Linderman was influenced by the Vietnam War and, and, and influenced by uh, the civilians and soldiers uh, in Vietnam who were clearly at odds in many cases. And so that certainly shaped Linderman's view of the Civil War, but I think he's still right that we see Civil War soldiers over time um, feeling that the people were insulated, and they were insulated from what they were seeing. And I think they were also frustrated because the access to the war was coming through newspapers. And all you have to do, and I think, again, excited to see what Jim is going to do on this point, is all you have to do is look at Harper's Weekly, uh, look at the illustrations for Fredericksburg in December of 1862. You get no sense of the murderous attacks before Marie's Heights. Instead, those attacks, they look uh, as if they are sweeping across a parade ground. Everything is heroic. There's very little blood. There's no fear. There's none of that. And so for this surgeon, his frustration was shared by many other Union soldiers and Confederate, but particularly Union soldiers who could not get people back home to feel the war as they were feeling it. And to make matters worse, they knew that the people back home were picking up a paper. And in that paper, it was a romantic, dramatic rendering of the hell that they were passing through, that the soldiers were passing through. Now, here's a question for you, Pete. Um, I, I, well, let me check in, in the comments to make sure someone hasn't already sort of asked these questions. Um, but um, this is something that I think someone might be thinking, it says, you know, they might be thinking, well, okay, we, we were just looking at this previous document and you were, you know, we were just saying about how this is interesting, but it doesn't actually mean what it says, you know, it might not be indicative of what it says. Whereas this we're saying, well, clearly he has a tough time of it. You know, it does mean, you know, what he says it means. Um, or I'm, I'm not phrasing that very well. No, no, I know exactly what you're saying. I, I, you know, I'll just say that. Look, the, the document, the, um, the, the declaration from the Confederate Brigade in Wharton's division, I'm not suggesting that there isn't some truth to this. Sure. And I can assure you that this committee, which was likely composed of officers, they believe every word of this. But again, in believing that word, we can't overlook what the intent was. The intent is to control and shape and direct political action. And we have to remind ourselves that this document is put forth to represent everybody's views. That's what they're doing here. And I'm saying that that's just not possibly, that's just simply not the case. We know that there were too many deserters who did not believe in this. I mean, that's just the hard fact. And so th that's the key part about this document. The mm -hmm. document is put forth as a public document and it is put forth to speak for everybody. 
that was in Forsberg's brigade. We know that's just absolutely not the case. But right. more importantly, we want to understand what are the underlying themes of this resolution that's, and again, an attempt to shape political behavior. And we see it. You demonize the Yankees. You elevate Lee as almost as what? The second coming of Jesus Christ, right? You put all your faith in this great Christian gentleman and that we're in a war. It's a war for our sur survival. This committee, you put this together, they believed every word of it. But it goes beyond just saying, oh, well, they believed in it. Thus, they had a strong commitment to the war and they were highly nationalistic. It doesn't do much for me. What does something for me is to recognize that they're putting this out there because they're in trouble. They're in trouble. And we all know they were in trouble. It's fall, late fall, early spring of 65, or late fall 64, early spring 65. We know things were unraveling for the Confederacy. So it's the, you know, kind of the collective nature of this document and the fact that it's public that, you know, you makes you hesitate to, to see what this can reveal, whereas this is more of a private individual's look at things that makes this a little more persuasive to take parts of it, you know, um, you know, at, at face value. John, I'll say again, we just ask ourselves, why did this surgeon, William, his first name, why did he feel compelled to write this to mm -hmm. his wife? What pressed him to do this? Well, we see that he wanted to try to get her to feel the war, to, to see what he saw, right? To hear what he heard. That's so important to him. Now, did he leave things out? Or I suspected he did, in part because, hell, he's only got a few pages here. And he's a surgeon, and he's busy, and he's tired. And I tell my students that all the time. When we read a battle letter, and many battle letters, they just cover where the regiment is moved. They often frame that within heroic terms. They want the people back home to take pride in what that unit did. Is any of that a falsification of the past? Uh, I wouldn't be my conclusion. But my conclusion would be is that that description has a lot of silences and, and those silences are intentional. And I think that there are silences probably in this as well. Again, the point is to not reject sources and to not say fake right. news, fake history. I'm not saying that at all, right? And so again, you can read deeply into this source. You can read deeply into this and see some of the frustrations that William and others felt toward the people back home. And we see that very clearly. Mm -hmm. And we also see how the war is lingering with him, right? It's, Absolutely. It, 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 the sounds are in his head. They're in his head. I'm always so still struck by the inability of Civil War soldiers both sides, how difficult it was for them to make that linkage, that connection that we do today between what they saw, what they heard, what they felt in battle, and we were, you and I would call trauma. They, they just don't make that linkage. The David Beam, the soldier from Indiana, whose letters I read when I was in high school, he wrote after Antietam that the sounds of the cannonading that that they were inescapable in his mind. He could not quiet them. And then a few weeks later, he essentially has a physical breakdown. He's in a private home outside Harper's Ferry. He wrote his wife that he could not keep his pen from shaking all over the paper. And that he looked out the window and he said that basically he felt lost. He never ever made the linkage, the connection between what he had endured at Antietam in front of the bloody lane is why he was in this private home and that his hand was jittery and that he couldn't really make sense of the war anymore. That connection between experience and this mental breakdown, I've not seen many linkages between it and I don't think we see it here either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well kind of- it's uh, fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah, fascinating. Agreed. Uh, uh, along that theme about, you know, how this stuff, you know, really, really sticks with these people. I, I I'd love to talk about sure. um, this source here, Henry uh, Owen. written by Henry, oh, Owen. Name? Hen Henry uh, Owen. Henry Owen, that's right. Um, uh, so talk a little bit about sure. you know, the, the context for this source, and then uh, we could start to get into so, what we can yeah. get from it. The, these letters are at the Library of Virginia, uh, and then uh, three individuals, there you have it. They, they uh, transcribed them and published them in this book, which you can get on Amazon. 
And, uh, but I was down, I wasn't aware of this book. I was down at uh, the Library of Virginia copying them. So I have the originals that I'm going through right now. I'm working, by the way, on a Gettysburg book because of course we all know we need another book on the Battle of Gettysburg. Right? The people are desperate for it. We, so we know so little is, information about the battle. It is. It's really a lot, of, a lot of hard research for me these days. Uh, but what I want to do is I'll tell the story of Gettysburg uh, in a sense like Killer Angels. And I love how Shara did it from really the high command perspective. Uh, but what I'm, what, what I'm intending to do is to do it from the perspective of the common soldier through three Confederates, three Union soldiers, and an enslaved man. And one of the Confederates is Mr. Owen here. Owen survived Pickett's charge. He was in the 18th Virginia. Uh, that is Garnett's brigade. And after um, on their regiment, I believe, suffered something like 79% casualties on July 3rd. 79%. Staggering. Mm -hmm. the, um, he and uh, his uh, fellow comrades get back into Virginia, make their way over to Culpeper. We saw the date of the letter, I believe it was July 19th. And they happened to go to the very camp they occupied the previous June, right when the Gettysburg campaign started. They get right back to that camp. And so everyone has lost friends and comrades. This is the second paragraph. I did not fully appreciate the misfortune until they reached this camp. I came to the familiar spot where my tent stood when we were here in June and how sad and lonely it made me feel to look around and miss so many friendly and familiar faces. Six, I, I think that stared, that's gotten where six stared on my tent then. I think that's a typo. I think that should be shared. Mm -hmm. Six shared possibly my tent then and now I am only left to visit the scene of our resting place. Near me stood Lieutenant Watkins tent with six inmates, and not one is left to reclaim the spot. On another side of my tent, a few yards off, was the shanty of two other, other of my men, both gone, one killed, the other a prisoner wounded. Thus it is all over the woods and in all the companies, but the saddest sight and then it's right here, he talks about this man who his best friend was his brother, his, best, his brother has, has likely been killed at Gettysburg, certainly missing in action. He sees the old tent site, and then the man walks off into the woods, puts his hand on his jaws and says, and you know, always says, this is a picture that, uh, of distress that he had ever beheld in the war. The only companion he had for a long time and was with him there, was his brother and he is reported killed. And then the, the letter goes on. It's a heartbreaking letter. Oh yeah. And it's a letter again that, I mean, we're getting, giving Jim way too much airtime here. <laughs> it's right, it right at the heart of what Jim did so I think brilliantly in his book. I said, he took our understanding of comradeship and enabled us to see it in its emotional level, its emotional dimensions. We see that these men uh, drew a sense of connectedness to their fellow soldiers in ways that I think actually surprised them. And what's even more telling is the openness in which they express that affection and that devotion to their fellow comrades uh, is really quite powerful and is incredibly touching. And so we mentioned something about Gerald Linderman before. One of the things that I think he got wrong and got it wrong pretty badly is the idea that Civil War soldiers became hardened over time. There's no question that these men, they got used to the sights that, they, that were truly you know, horrifying, horrendous things. Uh, they got used to it, there, there's no doubt. And they were able to adjust and cope. But just because they were able to cope didn't mean that they became hardened. Because what soldiers on both sides feared above everything else was a, a loss of, of sympathy. If they lost sympathy, they lost a sort of sensitivity that made them civilized people. They were all frightened on both sides that they'd just become brutes. And according to Linderman, that's what happened to too many soldiers. They became hardened brutes. They became just the opposite. And these letters are not only a testament to that fact, that you can see this emotional outpouring from Mr. Owen. But the letter itself was so important for men on both sides. The letters became a way to sort of get air, right? 
mm -hmm. to be able to reach out back to their loved ones, to their wives, right, to their girlfriends, to their mothers, right, to reach back and to say, you know, that part of my humanity is still here. And I feel it when I look at my comrades who have been taken down, whether by a bullet or by a sickness and disease. And it's a poignant and it's a powerful testament to the humanity of these men on both sides. I don't give a damn about whether he fought for slavery or not. I care about him as a human being going through this horrific ordeal. And I'm reminded of Joshua Chamberlain now, because of course I'm at Gettysburg and the Adams County Chamber of Commerce requires that I mention Joshua Chamberlain in every talk that I give because of the <laughs> he calling card here. Joshua Chamberlain, after Strong Vincent, the Bilal Brigade commander who Chamberlain had so much admiration for, he, Chamberlain and his fellow officers after Gettysburg pulled their money together and they got what I think in essence was like a locket with little teardrop diamonds around it. And you could open it up and I assume you could put a picture of Strong Vincent in it or maybe a lock of his hair because the officers in Chamberlain intended to give it as a gift, which I assume they did, to Strong Vincent's widow. And in the letter to Chamberlain's wife, Fanny, Chamberlain wrote that he would take the locket and he would take the locket and he would go back and forth, like in a sense, almost hypnotizing himself. And he said in so doing, he felt this sense of melancholy. This sense of melancholy can show you how they're so different from us, right? He, he is taking himself down this dark road because he wanted to do what? He wanted to feel. He wanted to make sure he could feel. And what was so telling about this letter is he ended by saying to his wife, do you see? that we have not lost our sense of civilization. We are still civilized men. And they found it even through death. Death of these men who they loved, loved like family members, loved like brothers. It's a powerful letter. Mm -hmm. and, powerful, and powerful this, letter. this uh, isn't exactly a hot take um, but with all these documents that we've looked at today, um, what they get to and in kind of very different ways is not just how physically devastating the Civil War was, which of course is something we talk about here at the Museum of Civil War Medicine pretty regularly, uh, but how emotionally devastating uh, the Civil War was, which again, it's not a hot take. It's not something that <laughs> maybe we, you know, we probably already knew, but um, they each of these documents, even the uh, the petition, um, gets at it um, in in their own ways um, to exactly but, but, how but devastating John, emotionally this was. Yeah. And John, though, and again, I'll say that what you're suggesting here is important because it gets beyond just saying, "Oh, these men were emotionally devastated; these men were suffering," you know, uh, from a, a desolation that they could not recover from. Many of them did. But there's a more important point when we think about these emotions. And these emotions came to serve as a powerful bond. They had ultimately actually political value. Think about the survivors here. Think about what they had seen and think about the future. You're not gonna be inclined to maybe give up this war after you have lost so much. You're certainly not inclined to bury the dead and to say, well, damn, this cause was a wrong cause. We made a huge mistake here, right? Is it just the opposite? We've got to continue the fight. So the, the emotional expressions and the political implications of those expressions do matter. And for those who say, and here I'm now gonna defend what I was making fun of earlier, that this is just a bunch of academic nonsense, shame on them, shame on them, right? Look, the Civil War is a, 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 not just about a chessboard on the battlefield. And when we reduce it to that, we dishonor those men. If you want to understand and bring meaning to what happened on this battlefield, know where they fought. But also know how they experienced that, how they made sense of that. It is an impoverished view of Civil War history when we just do tactical history and stop the story there. So much more that can, I think, be done when we bring in the emotional aspects. 
And that's uh, the beauty when tackling primary sources. Sometimes you never really know uh, which way the conversation is going to go. I don't think either of us necessarily expected um, to wind up um, talking as much about emotional history as, as we did. And there's uh, a, a increasingly rich field in the history of emotions um, out there when it comes to, to uh, the Civil War. So um, I, I, I know I quite enjoyed that exercise. Hopefully our, our viewers did as well. Um, we're uh, pretty much uh, at the end of our, our time here. Um, but the beauty of uh, an exercise like this going through primary sources and this digital medium, this doesn't have to be the last one of these programs that we ever do. So who knows, we might be back um, someday, viewers. If you I'm gonna get a quick plug as well as the Civil War Institute. We in fact are, we are slated to go in June. We already have our schedule, uh, it's already up. And of course we will do it all in social distancing and uh, take all the precautions that we need to take. But one of the things that John has been a part of at the Civil War Institute and, and others is that we have breakout sessions where you sit with a historian and you talk about documents and you discuss them. Uh, the Institute uh, every year puts on a conference that is widely accessible, meaning that people of all backgrounds and all interests that they have uh, participated in. And it is always, again, a good thing when we partner with all these Civil War institutes, museums, from the Civil War Museum up at Harrisburg to us, to you all in Frederick, to Jim's place down in Shepherd. We have great synergy, as they say. I can't believe I just used that word. You'll never have me back on the show again. I should have <laughs> never said that. But we do. And I want to say, John, you might not even be aware of this. We are sending, I hope, one of our Pohanka, Brian Pohanka summer interns down to the Frederick Medical Museum this summer. But yes, you guys, uh, hey, listen. I, I spoke with him literally this morning. So. Fantastic. I'm, I'm so excited. If I had hearts, I would put a bunch of hearts on my screen right now. <laughs> and I'm so happy because you know why, John? I know my student is going to get excellent training from you all this summer. I'm very excited about that. That's, uh, that's the hope. Um, so the, again, the, the best ways, so we hope you enjoyed the program today. Uh, like the video, share the video, uh, like both the National Museum of Civil War Medicine and the Civil War Institute at Gettysburg College on Facebook. That's the best place to find uh, me and Pete uh, digitally. Uh, and uh, great ways to support both of our organizations is to become a member uh, of the museum. You'll find a link in the comments and to go to the uh, Civil War Institute Summer Conference uh, which I've been to many times and I can't recommend enough. It's, uh, it's a blast and uh, you learn all kinds. Um, so if you enjoyed our conversation, you can get more of the same or at least similar, um, uh, both here on our Facebook page and uh, over on the, uh, the Civil War Institute's uh, Facebook page. Um, so thanks so much for being with us, Pete. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you viewers for joining us today. Um, this is